Subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update from Rouse IAS. Do not forget to subscribe to our Telegram channel for all the updates and materials. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper analysis from the perspective of civil services examination. Today we have taken up Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 28th of August 2021. The articles which we are going to cover today have been displayed on your screen. And let us now begin the discussion. So the first news which we are going to take up appears on page number 6. Why are hydropower projects in Himalayas at risk? So the Environment Ministry in an affidavit placed in Supreme Court earlier this month has disclosed that it has permitted 7 hydroelectric power projects which are reportedly in advanced stages of construction to go ahead. One of them is 512 megawatt Tapo 1 Vishnugarh project in Joshimat, Uttarakhand which was recently damaged by floods or glacial lake outburst floods in February 2021. Not just this, if you go back 10 years, in the aftermath of Kedarnath floods in 2013 that killed around 5000 people, the Supreme Court had halted the development of hydroelectric projects in Uttarakhand pending a review by Environment Ministry on the role of such projects in amplifying the disasters in the mountainous regions of Himalayas. So you can clearly see two pushes. One is from the government side to construct more and more hydroelectric projects to harness the hydroelectricity. On the other hand, concerns raised by judiciary and conservationists who talk about the demerits of HEPs. Now this is a very very important dichotomy which you should be aware of because it clearly forms the part of your syllabus under GS paper 3 under infrastructure you have an energy component. If you look at the power generation sector in India, out of 386 odd gigawatts that India produces every year, around 46 gigawatt that is around 12% of the overall electricity was produced by hydroelectric projects. This is around 6 times that of produced by nuclear and half of that contributed by solar and wind. So you can say that the contribution of hydroelectric projects in overall energy security in our country is massive. And so it becomes important for us to understand this whole dichotomy. But of course, like always, we are going to start with a brief idea about what hydroelectricity is and how it is generated. Now to understand the hydroelectricity, you will have to first revise the water cycle. Because understanding the water cycle is important to understand the hydropower. And we know that water cycle has three steps. It starts with solar energy heating the water on the surface of rivers, lakes and oceans, which causes the water to evaporate. Water vapors then condense to form clouds and falls as precipitation like in the form of rainfall and snowfall. Precipitation then collects in streams and rivers which empty into oceans and lakes where it evaporates and cycle continues. Now the amount of precipitation that drains into rivers and streams in a geographic area determines the amount of water available for producing hydropower. Seasonal variations in precipitation and long-term changes in precipitation patterns such as droughts can have large effect on availability of hydropower production. So as the name suggests, hydropower is the use of falling or fast running water to produce electricity or power. This is obviously achieved by converting the gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy and then finally to produce the electrical energy by turning the turbines. Now if we talk about the types of projects or the way they utilize the running water, we can categorize the hydroelectric plants into two categories, run of the river projects and storage system projects. So under the run of the river projects, the force of the river's current applies pressure on turbine and they really do not have a damming facility or a reservoir to conserve or store the water. Whereas in case of later, in case of storage system projects, the water is first accumulated in reservoirs created by dams on streams and is then released through hydro turbines as needed to generate electricity. And India is now building both of them. Run of the river projects in mountainous areas and wherever the space is available to create dams and reservoirs, we resort to storage system because of their ability and capacity to produce large amount of electricity. Now whenever we talk about any dichotomy or conflicting socio-economic goals as given in the main syllabus, we always have to look on both sides of the coin. 
when the government is insisting on resorting to more and more hydropower projects it means there has to be a certain amount of merits for example its renewable nature its emission free power production and its various other concomitant benefits at the same time the civil society environmentalist and judiciary is trying to scrutinize these projects which means it has to have a lot of demerits as well and so let us look into them in detail and to start with the biggest advantage of hydroelectric projects is that they are renewable in nature initially the government of india had recognized smaller run of the river projects as renewable but recently that category has been done away with and now all the hydroelectric projects are categorized as renewable which basically means that it will never run out of power unless and until of course the stream itself dries down and as a result these projects are built to last for a very very long time so for example the oldest hydropower plant in india is in darjeeling district in west bengal it was commissioned in 1897 and it is still functional with a capacity of 130 kilowatt another way to look at their renewable nature is to look at the water and its characteristics once it flows into the plant and once it flows out of the plant there is hardly any change in either the water quantity or its quality which is quite unlike other sources of power so renewable is one what about emissions in the times when almost all the activities across the world are being scrutinized as to how much emissions they induce hydroelectric power are a blessing because hydroelectricity when it is produced it is absolutely free of any kind of emission and that is also one of the biggest advantages this is also the reason why the government of india is pushing so much of hydroelectricity because first india has plenty because india has himalayas apart from that it does not causes any emissions and so it will be very very easy for india to meet its target under the paris climate deal now a lot of people argue that this quality of hydroelectric projects to be renewable in nature and to not cause any emission is actually same as that of solar and wind and so when hydroelectricity has so many disadvantages why not resort completely to wind and solar and the reason behind that is it's just not renewable and emission free it's also very very reliable as well as adjustable which is not the case with solar and wind systems of production of power and the reason behind that is that solar power plants produce power only when sun is around similarly wind is not always blowing and when it is blowing it's not at the same constant speed and so that is why it is very very difficult to achieve or hit the target right all the time with solar and wind and so they have a supplementary role to play which is quite unlike the reliability which coal offers you reduce the amount of coal burning in your plant you reduce the amount of electricity which is being produced and similar is the case with hydroelectric projects especially those which have their own dams because if you can make sure that dam has a minimum amount of water you can make sure that a constant rate electricity is produced throughout the year and this is especially applicable for all those dams and projects which are based on rivers which have their source in himalayas because their source is in glacier and so they are never out of supply of water now as we have discussed that most of the mega hydroelectric projects are based on storage systems which means that they create dams and hence water reservoir is created now of course one of the uses of water in the reservoir is to create electricity but there are a lot of other advantages of that water as well now usually the hydroelectric projects are shaped or designed in the form of multi purpose projects they just do not store water for electricity because water is exactly not being used while creation of electricity you can use them for other purposes as well you can make canal from those dams which can either be used for navigation and also for irrigating agricultural fields in nearby areas then of course they become a great tourist spot which are frequently visited by tourists and a lot of wetlands in our country have been created on the dams made for hydroelectric projects wetlands as we all know are very very crucially important for conservation of some of the very important species and not just that efficient management of dam 
can also reduce the probability of floods in the downstream areas and in fact a lot of projects have been constructed not just for hydroelectricity but also for flood prevention and one of the best example of that would be Damodar Valley project it's all about a series of dams and hydropower plants constructed on Damodar river for example, Maithon, Panchet and Tilaya, all these dams have been constructed to harness the hydroelectricity or hydral power. But also, apart from this, an objective was to prevent the annual flooding of West Bengal due to the overflow of Damodar River. And then finally, something which cannot be forgotten about HEP, especially in Indian context, is that overall development of area and especially the infrastructure creation. Because first and foremost, hydropower projects are mega projects. And hence, they require a complete settlement of the size of a small city in order to be functional. But not just settlements. They also require the most advanced system of transport for the large and mega machinery to reach these places. For example, they require very wide highways, well-functioning system of railways, only then a hydro project becomes successful. So you can see that it's just not about electricity. It's about the renewable nature of the electricity which is produced, the reliability of that production, various other benefits which it brings along the way like infrastructure creation and biodiversity protection are the benefits because of which most of the governments including Indian government likes these projects very much. But having said all of this, they do have their fair share of disadvantages. And to start with, the biggest disadvantage is their higher initial cost of setup. These projects are very, very expensive to build. And not just that, they should be built to the highest standard possible simply because lakhs and lakhs of lives depend on the stability of these dams. If they collapse, they are going to cause a disaster which would then lead to a lot of loss of life and property. Now, if you focus on the graph which is on your screen, you can compare the nuclear, hydro, thermal, wind, solar and other kinds of power projects. And you can see that it is next only to the nuclear power plants. It is around 10 to 15 times more expensive than other form of renewable energy, for example, solar and wind. Then higher initial cost would be bearable if they could be constructed in a very, very short period of time. But as a matter of fact, they take a lot of time. Sometimes it might take three decades for a hydropower project to become functional. One of the reasons is that they are normally situated in a very, very difficult to reach areas like mountains. And so it's not very difficult to transport people and material over there. Then these areas are also frequently visited by disasters. For example, the recent destruction of Vishnugar project in Uttarakhand because of the GLOF. And so that is why it takes a lot of time for them to be constructed and so it is a huge financial investment over there. Then the problem is just not about initial cost. As they start to function, a lot of issues crop up and it becomes increasingly difficult to maintain them. For example, once they start running, there's a problem of siltation on dams because when the river flow, along with it, it brings along a lot of sediments which are then deposited at the gates of the dam because of which the capacity of the dam to store water reduces because a lot of space is then taken by the sediments and so it has to be desilted or cleaned from time to time and let me tell you it is not a very easy or a cheap job then creation of reservoir and dam means submerging or flooding a lot of areas which would then mean relocating and resettling a lot of people most of these belonging to vulnerable sections of the society. For example, tribals. Now this relocation and resettlement might seem like a very, very simple task. But you should remember that you are not dealing with one or two people. You are dealing with villages, a lot of them. Sometimes it could be small towns as well. And so these are not just homes or a group of homes. These are whole ecosystems where people just do not have their homes, but they also have their livelihoods. And it is very, very easy to resettle people, but not the ecosystem. And it takes a lot of time before which the same ecosystem can be regenerated at a new place. Then of course, the impact on biodiversity is not very difficult to think of. Submergence of an area with water and a deep water leads to alteration of ecology of that particular area, which, which then has to go through secondary succession 
then creation of dam fragments the ecology of river so for example if a continuously flowing river has a species of fish going from point a to b and we have constructed a dam over here now the population of fish has been fragmented into two which eventually leads to loss of lot of species apart from that we also know that once the dam gates are closed the flow of the water reduces to a great extent and so downstream there is less water available and then it transforms the ecology or the ecosystem in the downstream of river as well now when we talked about the emission free status or nature of hep's we forgot one thing and that was emission due to decomposition decomposition due to submergence when dams are constructed a massive area is underwater and it leads to decomposition these large areas of standing water with a lot of flora start to emit methane as soon as the decomposition begins so these large areas with standing water as soon as they submerge the complete flora of that area they start emitting methane and they become a large source of methane which is quite an efficient greenhouse gas and then finally let's now focus on the disaster risk which is induced by these hydro powers which is also the focus of today's article because of which we are discussing the whole thing now dams may be very very strong they could be built with the highest standards across the world but the possibility of failure of dam can never be denied at the same time in order to maintain the optimum level of water in a dam so that it does not overflows is a very technical and challenging job and so construction of a hydro project could be complicated but the management of dam is even more complicated and combine that with the weak weather forecasting that we have in our country as of now floods become too risky to maintain and if you are reading the newspaper regularly most of the floods especially in urban areas are being caused due to poor management of gates of dams the management authorities do not have any idea as to when to open the gates so that the optimum level of water in a dam is maintained at the same time conserving a lot of water in an area changes the dynamics you are playing around with seismicity a lot especially in fragile areas like himalayas which already have three major fault lines in them and so if you are storing large quantities of water in place of air you are changing the dynamics of that region and so often the earthquakes have been associated with increasing dam activity in region and so because of these associated risks policy makers are often divided on the benefits and disadvantages of hydro power now as far as civil services examination and main stage is concerned of course you have to present both the arguments and then which side you want to take will be decided either by the question or by your own views let us now move on to the next discussion asha workers losing hope appears on page number 3 in delhi edition which is the page which covers the delhi city news but nonetheless it becomes important for all of us because asha workers or accredited social health activists are not being paid and this is not just the case with delhi but across the country now asha workers are community health worker which were instituted by the ministry of health and family welfare as a part of india's rural health mission and they have a very very crucial role to play especially in india's health regime and their role gets amplified in rural areas Now if you are wondering how does it maps with your syllabus if you look into GS paper 2 it says government policies and interventions for development in various sectors and issues arising out of their design and implementation so you can clearly see that how asha and challenges related to asha are being directly covered with your syllabus not just that upsc in 2012 prelims examination has asked about the jobs done or the duties of asha workers which we are going to understand when we will deal with their importance so all the basic stuff related to asha for example the ministry the schemes under which they function how they are chosen all of it has been given as a form of mcq which you can go on e learn platform to attempt and also in the pdf of today's dns but today what we are going to do is that first we are going to understand the need or the significance of asha workers and since the inception of their job what are the challenges which they face so as i have already stated that ashas are community health workers 
or in other word a member of the community who is chosen by the community members to provide basic health and medical care within that community she may or may not be a properly trained medical professional of course some kind of training is later on provided to these people but to begin with they might not have any kind of medical education but still it was thought necessary to include them in india's health setup and why was that that was because despite india's very very elaborate public health system consisting of tertiary secondary primary health centers these centers were not well connected with the community they were catering to and there was a need to connect them with a bridge with a person who comes from the same community and so an asha is a woman selected by the community resident in the community and who is trained deployed and supported to function in her own village to improve the health status of the people through securing their access to health services and so she can be best described as a bridge between india's health system and the community her job responsibilities are threefold first is to act as a link worker or maybe a bridge then to act as a community health worker so her role as community health worker includes depot holder of essential medicine in the village and to treat minor ailments among the community members but one of the roles for which the asha is extremely appreciated for is her role as a health activist creating health awareness and mobilizing the community for change in health attitudes and health status of the community and now for this particular purpose the role of asha even becomes more important because the public health system is mainly comprised of outsiders so if there is a doctor he is more often than not from some city or from some other village who is posted at a particular health center and so the locals might not be expected to trust that person also the kind of disease which we are fighting against for example hiv tb maternal issues all of it require the intervention of a woman because they deal with women and so women of an area are more likely to pay heed to what a woman their sister their friend the person they know since 20 10 years they are more likely to listen to that person and so that is why asha was conceptualized in 2012 upsc had asked with reference to nrhm or national rural health mission which of the following are the jobs of asha a trained community health worker accompanying women to health facility for antenatal care checkup using pregnancy test kits for early detection of pregnancy providing information on nutrition and immunization conducting the delivery of baby and let's say if you did not know what are the functions of asha but you knew this much that she is a community health worker now can a community health worker be expected to conduct delivery of baby of course not because she is not a trained medical professional and this is exactly a job of a very trained professional and so you can clearly identify those options which do not have four in it of course you have reduced your choices by this guess and the right answer is 1 2 and 3 that is a and so through this previous year question what we have done is that we have understood the main functions of asha but let us look at the responsibilities of asha in detail starts with counseling about best feeding skilled birth attendance prevention of disease then sensitization of the community with respect to nutrition and other government programs provision of drugs malaria tuberculosis and diarrhea community mobilization planning and participation in community health and allied activities survey of health related events early diagnosis and scouting especially in case of antenatal and postnatal cares for institutionalization of delivery immunization diabetic tests and family planning for all of these things a plethora of responsibilities have been given on asha and so you can clearly see the key role being played by asha but for what but for challenges which they face in their day to day life which involves clashes with other healthcare professionals low and non fixed salary because of which we are discussing the news abysmal training and lack of dedicated funding so what is this clash between icds and health department now icds is integrated child development scheme now we have seen that ashas are appointed under nrhm 
but they are also expected to function under ICDS. And so they have to work in coordination with two departments, ICDS and Health and Medical Department. So Asha is expected to help AWW or Auxiliary Nurse Midwife, who is a key functionary under ICDS scheme. So the way schemes are conceptualized that each village is going to have one ASHA worker and one AWW worker. And so ASHA is expected to help AWW to implement ICDS activities at Anganwadi Center and hence the support which they get from AWW workers is very very important. And in a lot of instances it has been found that they get stuck between the two works and there is a lack of coordination between these two departments because of which they get confused as to their responsibilities. Then their salaries are very very low which you will get in the PDF. And combine that with lack of regular crediting of the salary. In some states delay has been years as far as the salaries are concerned which then demotivates them to function as the ASHA. Then we have seen that they are expected to treat minor ailments at the village level. And villagers know that what and villagers know about their expectations. But the state governments have been unable to actually train them for even these ailments. Which is quite insufficient to provide enough confidence to ASHA workers to go and treat the villages. And then finally, lack of dedicated funding. And this is different from the salaries which are being provided to them. Because there are a lot of expenses which they have to carry out. They have to roam around in the village, take the pregnant women to the nearest primary or the secondary healthcare center. And then it involves a lot of financial burden on part of ASHA. They are paid from NRHM fund for which they have to wait for a long time. The scheme does not have a dedicated budgetary allocation and the funds are arranged on ad hoc basis from different government schemes. For example, national immunization program. But until and unless they are managed from some other schemes, they remain unpaid. So these are the challenges which should be tackled by the government as soon as possible. There should be clearly defined, well-defined roles for both AWW and ASHA so that there is no clash with respect to their responsibilities and roles. They should get a fixed salary and a regular salary just like other government functionaries and officials. They should be properly trained to enable them to do well on their job. And finally, other expenses apart from the salary should also be taken care of by the scheme itself. Let us now move on to the next news. Plasmid DNA vaccine Zycov D is safe and effective for adolescents appears on page number 8. So Zycov D is world's first plasmid DNA vaccine for human use and this is being considered as some kind of a revolution as far as vaccines are concerned. So how exactly is it made and what is the fundamental behind it and how is it similar to RNA vaccine and how is it different from that is what we are going to discuss now. So DNA as we all know contains the genetic code of various components of an organ and not just the genetic code for components but also their functionalities. For the vaccine the part of COVID-19 virus that helps it enter the cell binding with the cell and causing the disease which is infamous spike protein is coded. When the vaccine is injected into human body it produces only the spike protein of the virus and simulates the immune system to generate antibodies and T cells immunity against the virus. So basically spike protein is the one which binds or helps the virus binds with the human cells. But it does not causes infection. And so it is safe to be emulated by any vaccine. Once the body sees a spike protein it starts building up antibody response. And so when a real coronavirus comes with the same spike protein, it helps to fight that. This DNA is laboratory made structure so it is completely artificial and is unable to interfere with other genetic functions and composition of humans. This DNA piece is enclosed by a membrane called plasmid to avoid extracellular degradation or degeneration of the vaccine outside the cell before it reaches the cell and to successfully enter the nucleus of target cells to induce a long-term immune response. DNA vaccine is very stable at higher temperatures which is unlike RNA vaccines. The initial development of DNA vaccine in larger animals and human bodies showed that DNA is well tolerated and has an excellent safety record. Now as far as comparison of mRNA and DNA vaccines are concerned two things we need to compare how they are similar and how are they different and as far as similarities go they are quite similar 
both deliver the message to the cell to create desired protein so the immune system creates a response against the protein both produce a specific portion of the virus which is spike protein in this case and both are laboratory made structures and not obtained from the actual virus and so the dna and rna vaccines are being touted for their cost effectiveness and ability to be developed more quickly than traditional protein vaccines Traditional vaccines often rely on actual viruses or viral protein grown in egg or cells. For example, your COVID shield is based on actual live virus which is not coronavirus but adenovirus. DNA and RNA vaccines on the other hand can theoretically be made more readily available because they rely on genetic code and not a live virus or bacteria. This makes them more cheaper as well. So COVID-19 vaccine from Pfizer BioNTech and another developed by Moderna are mRNA vaccines. So this is as far as the similarities goes, but there are two key differences. DNA is much easy to prepare in lab. DNA based vaccines will be around 10 times cheaper. DNA has to enter the nucleus of the cell to produce the spike protein. Whereas mRNA based vaccine uses ribosome in cytoplasm to produce spike protein. Now since in case of DNA vaccine, entry into nucleus is required and hence the safety concerns in this case are much higher. BCG vaccine 100 years and counting appears on page number 10. So it has been 100 years since the discovery of both insulin as well as BCG vaccine against tuberculosis. And so the article rightly appears in the Hindu. Now from the perspective of prelims examination, diseases are very very important. For example, this question in 2019, which one of the following statements is not correct? So here, reading a question is also very, very important because a lot of students got it wrong because they clearly did not read not before the correct. And so you have to basically identify incorrect statement. So statement A was hepatitis B virus is transmitted much like HIV. So hepatitis B is a viral infection and it is transmitted through contact with blood or other bodily fluids of an infected person which means that this statement is correct and so it cannot be the right answer. Statement B read, Hepatitis B unlike C does not have a vaccine. And this was the reason why the question was asked. And so this was the right answer because Hepatitis B has a vaccine which is also a mainstay of fight against this particular disease. Then statement C. Globally, the number of people infected with hepatitis B and C viruses are several times more than those infected with HIV, which is also correct and hence cannot be the right answer because you have to identify the incorrect statement. And similarly, statement D was also correct because some of those infected with hepatitis B and C viruses do not show symptoms for many years, just like HIV. And so now you can understand that to be able to answer a standard difficult question in prelims examination, you will have to understand the disease and not all the diseases. But clearly, tuberculosis is of course one of those diseases which you are expected to know, which is an airborne communicable disease caused by bacteria Bacillus mycobacterium tuberculosis. So this bacteria is airborne, which means it can be transmitted through coughing just like COVID. And typically they grow in body where oxygen and blood are in high amount. And so obviously 80% of the TB cases are pulmonary or those cases which infect the lung of people whereas 20% of the cases also infect brain, uterus, stomach, mouth, kidney, bones and these are called extra pulmonary TB. So from the first two paragraphs of this discussion what we can infer is that TB is caused by a bacteria and it is airborne and it just does not infect the lungs but other organs of the body as well but these cases are very low and so that is why we consider TB as something to do with lungs always. The mode of transmission is of course airborne, mainly through coughing, sneezing and spitting and not all people are equally vulnerable to this disease. Just like most other infectious disease, people with immune compromised situation like HIV, undernutrition, diabetic, people who do smoking and high alcohol consumption are more vulnerable to TB than others. As far as prevention is concerned, BCG vaccine for children have proven to be very very effective but there is no effective vaccine for adults and that is the main problem in our fight against TB. As far as diagnosis is concerned, early diagnosis is extremely important in fighting TB 
and sputum microscopy which studies the bacteria under the microscope is one of the very effective way of diagnosis. So what is the current status of TB in our country? India tops the list of 20 TB high burden countries in the world. According to WHO's Global TB 2019, out of 10 million global TB incidences, around 27% or you can say roughly one third of the cases across the world occur in our country. Not just that, once they occur, we are not able to prevent the prognosis of the disease which results in around 200 people dying per lakh population, which is very very high. It's not like government has not done anything. There was a national TB control program which is ongoing since 1962. Then it was revised in 1997 when the government of India adopted revised national TB control program under which directly observed treatment short course was initiated. And recently in 2017, we have national strategic plan for TB elimination. It aims to eliminate TB by 2025 which works on four pillars, detect, treat, prevent and build. The specific targets have been set with the base year of 2015. So by 2025, we should have reduced the incidence of TB by 80%, mortality by 90% and 0% patient having catastrophic expenditure due to TB. So this is how India is trying to manage the epidemic of TB. So BCG or Bacillus calmate gurin is named after its inventors Albert Calmet and Camel gurin. In countries where TB or leprosy is common, one dose is recommended in healthy babies as soon as possible after their birth. Whereas in areas where TB is not common, only children at high risk are typically immunized. Adults who do not have TB and have not been previously immunized but are frequently exposed may be immunized as well but the efficacy of vaccine on those people are not clearly understood. So what actually is contained in the vaccine? So vaccine is prepared from a strain, a different strain of bacteria, not the mycobacterium tuberculosis but mycobacterium bovi which has lost its ability to cause disease in humans because this is a TB bacteria which is modified itself to infect bovines or cattle. Because the living bacteria evolved to make the best use of available nutrients, they become less well adapted to human blood and can no longer induce disease when introduced into human cost. But still they are quite similar with the actual TB bacteria because of their common ancestry and they are sufficient to provide certain degree of immunity especially in case of children. So instead of directly using TB bacteria, you use a closely related bacteria which cannot infect humans but is more than sufficient to induce the immunity which is required to actually prevent the disease in most number of cases in children. The last news for today is Rajnath Commission's ICGS Vigra. Now ICGS is offshore patrol vessel for Indian Coast Guard and that is why the name Indian Coast Guard ship Vikra. Similarly when you read the name like INS which means Indian Naval Ship or that ship belongs to Indian Navy and similarly ICGS means Indian Coast Guard ship. So Vikra is the latest acquisition by our Indian Coast Guard and it is mainly a patrol vessel. Now if you are wondering why these kinds of news are important for us is because of many questions. One of them is this exhibit from 2016 which one of the following is the best description of INS Astradharini that was in news recently. And so these kinds of equipments, military equipments of India, Indian military which includes Navy, Army, Air Force and also includes the Coast Guard become very very important and only a very very shallow level of information. So as we have already discussed that it belongs to Vikram class. So what is this Vikram class? So basically Indian Navy or Coast Guard whenever they have to acquire something from foreign country or whenever something is designed indigenously one of the ships the first ship which becomes the prototype for later ships becomes the class of it. So for example when the Indian Coast Guard needed a petrol vessel l &T came up with an idea and it was approved and it was manufactured by them as well. When the first ship was manufactured, it became the ICGS Vikram and all the ships based on Vikram become Vikram class ships 
with the names starting with V. Vijay, Veer, Vara, Varad, Vajra and the latest addition being Vikra. And so that is why you have seven ships. Vikram, Vijay, Veer, Vara, Varad, Vajra and latest being Vikra. So altogether seven ships under Vikram class which means they are identical to each other. So the best part about them is that they are indigenously designed and manufactured and the main task for which these ships have been inducted is policing maritime zones, control and surveillance, search and rescue, pollution response, anti-smuggling and anti-piracy in the economic zone of the country.